Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this program. We are very honored to have uh, Mr. Frank Freddy here. We were just talking beforehand, and um, we were talking about the fact that most of Mr. Freddy's books have been translated into Dutch. Uh, fewer of his books have been translated into French, but most of his books have been translated into Dutch, and um, this one hasn't been. But we can change that today, if you're all very enthusiastic. And don't do things like that. Um, and um, uh, make it known that we would like to have this book in Dutch as well. Maybe we can uh, set the first step towards uh, this happening. Um, but I think, for the most of you, it will be a good read in English as well. Um, Let's try and delve into this. Um, I would like to just to start with the dedication. This book is dedicated to your father, um, and you say about him, who inspired me to love reading. Was your father and the fact that he inspired you to love reading um, the reason why you started to write this book? Well, partially, yeah. Uh, my father never finished high school in Latvia. I'm the first to ready to finish school and the first one to go to university. But my father loved reading. And uh, when I was six... Maybe just have the microphone a little bit closer to you. Sorry. Yeah, so. yeah. When I was six, uh, we were living in Hungary. This is in the Stalinist era. And uh, my father said to me, this is Christmas Eve, come into the room. And I come into the room and I said, look in the drawer. And I look in the drawer. And there were 15 books in the drawer. And he said to me, if you read all these books, I'll give you five pounds. <laughs> and I thought that was great. You know, five pounds was more money than I ever had. And the interesting thing was, I read the books, I got my five pounds, and, he, and then he left more books behind. But this time he didn't offer any money. <laughs> but nevertheless, because I got into the idea of reading, it kind of meant that I, from that point onwards, I always had a book in my pocket, so to speak. So I think my father, who left school when he was 14, loved the books, was a huge influence on my own reading later on in life. Yeah. That's a great story. Um, when uh, We'll just go through the book in, in, in a couple of big steps um, to begin with. And um, of course, you begin at the very first beginning uh, which is Socrates, um, which of course we all know through Plato. And um, of course we all know uh, in some way that Plato has said some weird uh, things about poets and poets not really being allowed to live in his perfect state. But if you're going uh, to read the texts again, if, as you did and, and, and written about it, uh, then it's really astonishing to see what he really says about a written text. It's really astonishing to, to see that he was so fearful of a medium that he um, so brilliantly used himself. So what was, do you, you think, this fear actually about? Yeah, I mean, I, I was very surprised because what happened was um, I, I wrote about Socrates in a different book um, and then somebody told me, you know, Frank, I don't know if you realize, but Socrates was really scared of written text. He didn't think that reading was a, was a good thing. It, it called writing a pharmacon, which is like a drug, uh, which you know, is, could be bad for you, could be a disease. So when I went back and I, I read Plato's Socrates on reading, I realized that he was the first person in history to express this idea, which would then be a permanent theme in Western culture, of being scared about what happens when ordinary people read a text. Because basically what he says is, you know, when I'm having a dialogue, an oral dialogue, I know I can control the discussion. You're in front of me. But a book or text travels uncontrolled and you don't know who's going to pick it up. And more importantly, you don't know what the reader will do with that book, how they will interpret it. 
And that was pretty much the same argument that later on the Catholic Church would use against the printing of a vernacular Bible, you know, in the, not in Latin, but in the vernacular. And that was pretty much the discussion now we're having in the 21st century on the internet. You know, oh my God, these children going on the internet, that will destroy their way of life. <coughs> and what I'm very interested in is the way in which the fear of reading, the real uh, tension of our reading precedes the love of reading. You know, the, the, the fear element, this contradiction that somehow reading is a dangerous phenomenon uh, is, is really a powerful theme that begin with Socrates and continues on to today. Yeah. So how should we understand then um, what Plato did? Because Plato was as afraid of written texts as Socrates, um, and yet he is the very first one writing and constructing a systematic system of thought. So was it kind of an evil spirit, an evil genius who is okay with him having uh, the big weapon, but fearful of other people having the, the same weapon? Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it evil. I, I don't <laughs> like the word evil. It reminds me of uh, an, another discussion. I think that uh, what Plato did was pretty much what a lot of people ha in the uh, cultural elites have done in the centuries, mm -hmm. which is basically they argue that it's okay for me, it's okay for people like me to read books. But when you get those ordinary people, you know, it will corrupt them, it will make them bad, you know, and therefore we should keep the masses away from book. And I think that anti-democratic impulse uh, is, is so powerful in reading. And you have to remember, I don't know if you realize that anti-democratic philosophy and anti-democratic political theory comes a long, long time before demo democratic theory develops. The oligarchical fear of the demos precedes a, a democratic, democratic imagination. And when it comes to reading, it's a very powerful thing. And, and even today we have, you know, sort of, I'm, I get really angry when I go to schools in England or America, and the teachers tell me that, you know, we shouldn't give these books to children. It's too complicated, you know, or, you know, and there's a horrible thing that teachers are forced to do in England, where you don't give the children books because it's too complicated. You give them a worksheet, a piece of paper, with a few drawings on it, and that will do. And that, that kind of uh, elitist paternalism is, is, I think, what's at the root of it. Yeah. Um, at the same time, for someone like Plato and, and, and the people who came after him, it was obviously clear uh, why they did this, why they were writing, because it structures your thoughts. And it structures your thoughts in such a way that it is possible to even uh, achieve some kind of abstraction. <coughs> um, so how did they um, go about with this knowledge that this is a very useful uh, technique that they had developed uh, and not given it to other people? Well, I think there is a, a sense in which knowledge is always seen as a form of power and you, you're really worried about that power being shared by too many people. And, and not necessarily because you're a bad person, but because you're worried about how they're going to use that power, what objectives they're going to have. <coughs> but also, I think it took a long time for um, people to realize, uh, even the Greeks, I don't think, realized <coughs> that the, the, the act of writing and the act of reading leads to this leap in the capacity to abstract. That you cannot have history, re history as you and I understand it, unless you have writing. That, you know, the minute you write something down, you got in your mind the possibility of having a fixed point in the past and maybe even an orientation to the future. So those insights took a long, long, long time to evolve. And you have to remember also that, especially with Christianity emerging, reading takes a different turn. With Christianity, reading becomes what I would call reading between the lines. You know, what's important are not the words, yeah. but the interpretation you give to it. So it's a different kind of journey that is being engaged in. And, and I think all those uh, insights will take a very long time to, yeah. to kind of become clear. At the same time, if you're talking about Christianity, or even before that, if you're uh, talking about Judaism, uh, there's also the, um, the concept of the letter of the law. In writing, it is possible 
to lay down the law and to uh, be able to say this is right and this is wrong. This is also something that uh, emerges with the written text. It is, but it becomes a, a dispute because uh, one of the reasons why <coughs> Jews, Jewish people were not liked was because they were called the people of the book. And because they were the people of the book, that was seen as you know, very fixed and very rigid. And uh, certainly uh, early Christian theologians would say you know, the, the Jews have this very fixed, narrow way of thinking, whereas we allow Christ to come into our soul and we interpret things in a different way. So there was all this tension between whether you uh, legalistically take the letter as, as it's written or whether you give way to interpretation and that tension, that dialectic between the strict interpretation and, and, and later on a more fluid one becomes a very important development of culture. Yes, somewhere you're right that the history of really copes for a large part with what's not on the page. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, well, throughout the book you quote people who consider reading instrumental in what uh, Michel de Montaigne calls the progress of self-knowledge. So reading in a way makes people self-aware and gives them a chance to develop their own opinions. Maybe if we take a giant leap to today and um, consider that we are all opinionated but we are not all very, um, let's say, we, we don't have uh, we, we, not all of us have read Michel de Montaigne, for instance. We are not those. Um, we are not um, necessarily people who have been educated by a long list of books, though. And still, we are opinionated. So, how does those uh, do those two things um, compare to each other? It, it's difficult because I know a lot of people. Uh, often say, if you haven't read this, or if you haven't read that, you're not educated. Um, and there's a kind of, uh, uh, almost like a, a very kind of egotistical desire to say, that's a good reader, that's a bad reader, and in between. I look at it different. The way I look at it is that uh, everybody in this room, without exception, whether they like it or not, uh, carries with them the intellectual, the <coughs> the aesthetic legacy of the past, which is filtered through all these books. And even if you haven't read uh, Montaigne, or even if you haven't read Diderot or, or Rousseau, nevertheless, uh, their ideas uh, have been distilled through other people, and they've crystallized into a kind of cultural insights. Uh, some are abstract, some are very down to earth, which we have internalized through our socialization. So you don't have to read those books, but what I think is important is to not to passively allow yourself to be socialized by the legacy of the past, but to find that, you know, find your own roadmap as to you know, who you are, because I think the important thing about reading is that uh, it provides you with a, an unusual medium to gain meaning about life, which is why, as, as, you, as many of you will know, the individual self, the sense of self, <coughs> self-consciousness, is inextricably linked with the rise of reading, particularly in the Renaissance <coughs> period. It's through reading that people became aware of themselves as selves, rather than as just you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry. <laughs> um, so it's interesting to see in your book that um, the democratization of reading um, of course, it follows the invention of the uh, the printing press, but the first step to democratizing reading is through religion, and um, especially in in Protestant countries. You mention uh, the fact that in Sweden, at one time, people were uh, obliged by law to learn to read, but then this democratization, of course, uh, has another effect. It's not just religion that is spread through written text, but people are going to <coughs> define themselves in other ways. Yes, and I, I think that uh, whenever I have a very bad day, which happens quite a few times, <laughs> uh, I often go back and, and read the, uh, 
autodidacts, you know, the, uh, the democratic uh, masses who almost learn to read for themselves because at a certain point in the late 18th, early 19th century, a lot of ordinary people began to <coughs> learn how to read for themselves. And it's interesting because at the moment in Anglo-American societies, many teachers have given up on teaching children how to read. They say it's too difficult. <laughs> you know, you know, we've got all these problems. You know, we can no longer teach them how to read. Whereas in the 19th century, people just, you know, if you wanted to read, they go away and they learn how to read. And, and it's remarkable. And so you see that people realize that books are going to become, first of all, a way of them ga gaining independence, intellectual independence, which is really crucial, that you feel that you got your own intellectual resources. And then secondly, that you, re re you kind of regard ideas as a medium of change, of positive, progressive change. And that kind of democratic moment in literature, it, and it's a very short, unfortunately, a very short, in historical terms, democratic moment, does create a, a, a very exciting culture, which for the first time is a mass culture rather than just simply a, a very narrow, limited one. There's an interesting statistic in your book uh, which says that um, in England in the 17th uh, century, the number of pamphlets uh, published increased from 22 in the year 1640 to 1,966 in 1642. So this, this is two years and an increase of way too much. Well, it, it, it's remarkable when you get the stories, you know, imagine you're in a, in a pub or a coffee house and you see somebody with a little pamphlet. What you usually get is that 20 people surround them and they demand that the guy read the pamphlet to them. And you got this, you know, sort of absolute desire. I have this one experience, which is the single most important political experience in my life, which is very similar. It was in 1956. I was uh, nine years old, living in Hungary, and this is in the months before the revolution breaks out. Uh, in, in revolution is in October, but in uh, April, May, everything's the same. You know, everybody's scared. Everybody is looking at their shoelaces. Nobody looks each other in the eye. And then what happens is that the students at the university start producing these pamphlets, you know, sort of, and they start handing them out. And I remember one, no one night, my father says, Frank, can you go out and get a pamphlet for us? <laughs> Nine-year-old, those days, that was allowed. I go out to get my sister to get a pamphlet. I, I go around, and there's like hundreds of people, they're all, fighting to get the pamphlets. And everybody wants to read the pamphlets. And you knew, when you look back upon it, that that was the, that was the critical moment. Because when people are so uh, desperate to read, then they're ready to make a revolution. They, then they want to change something. And that, those democratic moments are very precious, but they're few and far between, unfortunately. Yeah. So the st statistic that I just read um, was caused from the period of the English Civil War. Um, and uh, John Milton, the poet, um, uh, put forward in those years the fascinating concept of the fit reader, which maybe first, could you, could you maybe uh, short in, uh, in a few sentences uh, refresh our memories about the English Civil War, because uh, I don't think that we're all uh, uh, aware of this in, in detail. Well, the, uh, looking back upon that, I think the English Civil War was the single most important event in European history. Uh, more important that in, in many ways than the French Revolution, even because it gave many of the ideas to the French Revolution or anything else. And it really was about whether uh, England was going to become a monarchy, you know, an absolute <laughs> monarchy, or Parliament was going to uh, be the, the authority of the society. And Milton was a, a radical parliamentarian. And he wrote a, a, a wonderful book, which I still read all the time whenever I get sad or demoralized. And in this book, he developed the concept of the fit reader. And by the fit reader, what he meant was somebody, you know, like almost like everybody in this room, who he believed had the intellectual capacity <laughs> to discriminate between right and wrong, who didn't need a censor or a moral guide to tell them how to interpret the book, but could, could be relied upon to draw, you know, sort of the conclusions that needed to be drawn. So it, he had a tremendous amount of confidence in human capacity to intellectually develop and to discriminate. And I think that was a, 
that, that, that kind of approach, I think, is so precious because at the moment, in, certainly in America and in England, we, everybody wants to censor everybody else. So it's <laughs> kind of a, we live in a very different era now. Yeah. Isn't there all, also a, a little bit of uh, elitism in, in, in this concept of a fit reader? Because Milton says that, uh, or uh, yeah, he says that uh, the fit reader will be able to understand what he has written or what he meant to have said. Uh, isn't there also uh, just trace of elitism in that? Um, because that if people aren't really sure what he meant, they're maybe peer pressured into thinking that this must be it. Am I not, I, I'm a revolutionary now. Well, you may be right. Uh, I interpret Milton <coughs> as somebody that, ha obviously he's not a perfect person. I mean, none of us are, you know, angels. Um, but what Milton was really getting at I think was that he had a very high expectation of people. And obviously he had his limitations and there were times when he didn't live up to his own own principles. For example, he wrote a book against censorship, but then he was willing to censor certain you know, anti, you know, sort of religious thought himself on a bad day. So which is why I think that, you know, if, if you are gonna be for censorship, against censorship. It's important to be not to be selective, but to be against all forms of censorship. Yeah. You know, sort of. But Milton, to his credit, did have a very high expectation of ordinary people, and I think that was lovely. You know, at, at the time when, when people made distinctions between the, you know, the educated, the uneducated, the literate, the illiterate, all these labels, to whereby you were morally distinguished on the basis of your alleged uh, intellectual limits. Yeah. Because this is the next step uh, in, in the history of reading. Um, the division uh, of the reading public into an educated minority and uh, the masses and you introduced the, um, the concept of um, the shift from uh, intensive reading to extensive reading. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Well, well, in the history of reading we have <coughs> two very important phases. Intensive reading is when you read one book very, very slowly, very carefully, like the Bible. And some people would read the Bible 40 or 50 times in their lives. Or in, in, in the English language, it was Pilgrim's Progress. You know, if you're a Christian person, those are the two books you read and reread all the time. Whereas extensive reading is made possible by the commercialization of publishing in the late 18th century. And extensive reading is how you and I read. We jump from one book to the next. And sometimes, you know, I don't know about you, but I start reading a book and I say, this is crap. You know? <laughs> and I'm not gonna, I, life's too short to finish, so I'm gonna go on to something else. And that's what extensive reading is. It's a totally different process. And a lot of people are scared that with extensive <laughs> reading, the cultural authority that prevailed would lose its status. And particularly the oligarchies, you know, were worried that people would just read things that they disapproved of. Um. There's an interesting um, passage in your book uh, regarding the French Revolution. Um, I think you're quoting someone who says that um, the, uh, the pamphlets that were, that were uh, published uh, back then were probably more influential than the oratory, just because the oratory was out in the open and everyone could see what was happening and uh, the pamphlets were consu consumed silently. Um, so how do you think um, the shift was made between reading silently um, to making a revolution? Well, I think there were, there were two elements. I think silent reading is, in the eyes of many people, very subversive. Mm -hmm. like the Catholic Church used to call, call it the silent heretic. Because the mm -hmm. idea was if, if you read the Bible without a priest standing over you, God knows what you will interpret. <laughs> Right, and you will draw radical <coughs> conclusions. And similarly, a lot, of, a lot of the times there was this feeling that you know, these people are reading these books, but we don't know what they're thinking. We don't know what conclusion they're drawing. And, and that's very difficult to control. Yeah. Uh, you can control the voice much easier. And I think that's, that was one of the things that they were really, you know, sort of tremendously worried about. Is this even a notion that reading silently uh, wasn't the norm for a couple of ages that people uh, usually read reading out loud. Yes, I, I think silent reading is very new. And even when you had silent reading, 
you would have a, you, you would have this uh, custom in especially in uh, middle class families but also working class families of sitting around the table and taking turns reading a book that would be like you know like a, a social occasion it sounds quite sweet i don't know <laughs> i've never done it but there's something nice about you know sitting around yeah. <laughs> Well, there is kind of an example of that in your book, um, <laughs> namely the the, uh, the mania that, that emerged um, uh, after the publication of uh, Johan Goethe's uh, a novel, Die Leiden des Jungen Wirtes. Um, and well, it's fascinating to read the passages in your book because, uh, well, we get to the, the, the reason why it's fascinating, because there are uh, a lot of stories about people who well, copied uh, Vieta in his fashion choices, in his uh, romantic um, actions, um, and even in his suicide, or so they say. Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I, I, love, that, I, mean, I love that chapter, writing it, <laughs> because as a sociologist, it allowed me to bring sociology and literature together. And, uh, you know, I probably know Goethe's Werther was the, was the first novel that created what we call today a, a moral panic throughout Europe. And, and the people were really scared because a lot of young people began to imitate, they would dress the way that Werther dressed. And they would, uh, they used to have these uh, fan societies where they would go out and reenact the, the, the novel. And then what happened was that it was reported in England, in London, that a woman committed suicide. And when her body was found, she had a copy of Goethe's Werther by her. And then, in the next 20, 25 years, <coughs> you're getting all these stories, uh, you know, where they say uh, a woman was in a bed in New York, committed suicide, and there was a copy of Werther by her. And it, and it became almost like a, like a, a fictitious <coughs> kind of play that was being created, where the suicide epidemic uh, which everybody talked about was taking place. Not to censor in the book. It was banned in Hamburg, it was banned in Milan. Uh, and for decades and decades, people talked about how this is a very dangerous book that young people have to be protected from. And, and what I find very fascinating about it is, is the way in which uh, what is a, you know, a powerful you know, romantic novel then becomes a source of a, a moral panic not just in one country, but in the whole of Western societies at a very early point. It shows you the power of the media, even already in the 18th century. And it's a very powerful story indeed, because uh, when I was going to uh, high school, or the Dutch equivalent of that, um, the story was still taught. So I thought that it really happened, but you only found <coughs> maybe two or three cases in which we might be able to say that uh, the novel has something to do with the suicide. Yes, I mean, that's interesting because you have all these stories, you know, sort of, I have heard of hundreds of families who lost their loved one in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and when you look at it, you actually look more carefully because obvious that this is a fiction, you know, sort yeah. of, because it's always, every single time that they report a new suicide, it's the same <coughs> story as in London. And what's also interesting is that if you look at uh, the first 45 novels written in America, more than half of them, the plot is about a young woman or a young man committing suicide for romantic reasons. So it becomes this, if you read Jane Austen or if you read a lot of English literature, there's always a woman there reading words there. You know, it's, uh, I mean, it's always, you don't notice them, it's always there on the back table as a kind of hint of watch out, you know. So, so what does it say about our expectations of reading, <coughs> even nowadays? Because the, the same story you can tell about um, The Catcher in the Rye, uh, which uh, is supposed to be a book that is read by all the mass murderers, including John <laughs> Lennon's murderer, David, Mark David Chapman. Uh, I'm not sure, I think that uh, what I find quite fascinating is that we don't fear books in the same way. That's the cultural change that has occurred. So, I mean, I, I thought it was very interesting that there is no longer concern about morality and literature. Whereas in the, all the way until the 1950s, we were worried about books making you, you know, sort of sexually, you know, sort of perverted or doing all these other things. We don't have that. And I always think that, you know, when I'm going on a London tube, 
and there are 10 people in front of me reading Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> and the world has changed as far as these things are concerned. <laughs> but here we have a book with, uh, I guess, um, uh, a very direct physical effect in the behavior of some of its readers. Because in, in, uh, especially in, in, in Belgium and Holland, it was reported that the sale, sales of uh, bondage things, I'm not really an expert on this, uh, uh, but... <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, no, yeah. Not an expert. <laughs> <laughs> but I happen to know that the increase was 32%. <laughs> no, but there was quite a, a, a bit uh, more sales of, of those kinds of, uh, of sex toys um, immediately after uh, the, the Fifty Shades of Grey hype. So it, it, sometimes it can have an, an, an immediate, immediate and and a uh, concrete effect? Well, as a sociologist, I'm a little bit skeptical. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that uh, the stories that I've heard was that uh, there's all these scientific studies done <coughs> who reads uh, the book. They make the point that the women who read the book are likely to have had, uh, been abused as children, mm. right? Which I think is just a fantasy, you know, sort of their fantasy rather than anything else. So all the problems that are attached to normal world then get rediscovered through the readers of the book, just like before. And, it's, and, and they're projecting onto the readers of Fifty Shades of Grey their own fantasies, in a, in a sense. So, so no, I wonder if you have that. But then what you're describing is actually happening. But I interpret that as, a, as what I would call the pornographication of society, mm. where, where sex becomes commodified to the point at which it, it loses certain of its you know, sort of internal tension. And I think that as a result of that, you know, I mean, you have a different kind of culture where sex is seen entirely instrumentally. Uh, so for example, in, in, the, in England, you often hear two women talking to each other, openly talking about their sex toys. I really like my this, or, you know, sort of, and as a way of making, and they're just making a statement. You know, I mean, they know what they're doing. They're making a statement. I think that kind of pornographication element exists independent. The book itself is a symptom of that. Yeah. That we can now we're now free to talk dirty. I and mean, that's basically what they're saying. That's that's not the book, that's culture that so, driving that. So would you say that if a book or a pamphlet has a direct and concrete effect on its readers, it is bound to be political? Or <coughs> can it be in any other way um, influential? Well in a, in a direct way? Well, the, the interesting thing about a, a book having an influence is that everybody in this room can read the same book. But the influence <coughs> of the book will be very different on, on the people in the room because you know, we bring ourselves to the book. The reader is an active, mm -hmm. you know, interactive with the book. And I know very often the books that have the most incredible effect <coughs> on me are often books that other people you know, just kind of pass me by. And also, I, I read books when I was very young that made little impact on me. Uh, but later in life, like for example, we're talking about Jean-Paul Sartre's trilogy. You know, when I read it, I think I was too young to read it, you know, sort of very immature. And I remember the other day, I was talking to the book about, uh, about this book with my son, who's 21, and, and, that, and then I realized what an effect the book has had on me. But at the time, I didn't realize it. So I think it has both a direct and an indirect effect. Yeah. And I think it's, a, it's, it's not just political uh, with a capital P. I think it, it's a way we uh, find a mirror through which we can make a sense of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the nice thing about the book is that it, I think of a good book as a journey, which might, like any journey, end up in a horrible place, but might also end up in a wonderful, you know, with a wonderful, intense, you know, sensual, aesthetic experience. I mean, I think that's what's, what's great about reading. Yeah. So at the same time, um, without we, we being able to say that um, reading has a direct, let's say, physical effect on us, immediate physical effect on us, um, reading has been called a drug, a poison, a disease, it causes addiction, trauma, psychosis, and uh, too much reading will even clog your mind. <laughs> and reading a book is oftentimes described with the metaphor of <coughs> physically consuming and digesting texts. 
So where does that come from? Why, why do we talk about reading in that way? Well, I think it's very interesting, but we, this, has, this has been a constant theme of, of people seeing reading as having this uh, upsetting, you know, sort of physical dimensions. And you would have all these stories about young women who read a romantic novel and are never the same again. You know, their hand begins to shake and their, you know, mind, you know, they can no longer <coughs> go into the kitchen and make food and all the rest of that. So you have all these stories going on. And, and the tragedy is, is that even like in the 21st century, just when you think that we're beyond this, I would say that reading is more medicalized now than any other time. So for example, we have uh, you know, sort of a discovered attention deficit. Uh, so you have children who cannot read because they haven't got the mental capacity of attention. You know, we have dyslexia. I mean, there used to be a time when dyslexia was a minority of people now in England. Anybody who's sensitive has dyslexia. You know, I mean, in, in some schools, you have 30, 35 percent of kids getting extra time because they have dyslexia. And the worst thing now, I mean, something that I feel I've been writing about quite a lot, is, it, is, is we have reinvented the side that reading is traumatizing. So in, in American and English universities, there are big campaigns for trigger warnings. I don't know if you are familiar with a trigger warning. But what a trigger warning is, and this is, the students are going crazy over this in America. Basically, to give you an example, take the novel Great Gatsby. Well, the teachers, the professors are told, don't just give us Great Gatsby, but tell us, you know, this book contains scenes of domestic violence, <laughs> sexual assault, you know. So you've got to tell them all the bad things are going to happen. <laughs> so you warn before you read it. <laughs> and you have Greek tragedies written along that, you know, or the, not, or the poem, The Rape of Lucretia, uh, and demanding that people be given a trigger warning about all the bad things are going to happen. And I, w I was involved in a debate recently at a university where <coughs> Uh, the other professor was saying it's very important that we protect our students from the trauma of all these terrible things within the book. And I said, well, look, I don't know about you, but the whole thing about reading is, especially when you teach literature, is you want the kids to discover for themselves how they're going to react. You don't want to, it's not like when you're four, this is going to hurt you, little Mary. You, know, you want people to discover that. But they say, no, 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 that's, that's, that's too dangerous. <laughs> and we've got this new idea of, of trigger warnings and, and, and protecting people. And I think this is the university, by the way. This is, these are the, the intellectuals of the future. And, and if, they, if we treat them like fragile flowers in that kind of a way, we destroy the aesthetic, intense experience, the powerful experience that does come from reading. And, and uh, I am worried about this because it's spreading like wildfire at the moment. And, in, and not just in some universities, but the best universities, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, all, the, all these kind of places, it's, it's the new fashionable demand. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do a little quiz with the audience now. Uh, I'm going to read a, a quotation that I've taken out of a book. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you uh, in what year you think that this was written. <laughs> Sit tight. Such reading as at present prevails has, by reason both of its quality and quantity, led to a deterioration of the human species, physically, mentally, and morally. We entertain no doubt, nor do we see how, unless the vicious habit be somehow corrected. The race can escape from being ultimately divided into two sections, the members of one of which will be little removed from invalids and the members of the other scarcely distinguishable from cretins. Maybe the wording gives it a little bit away a little bit. With, in what century do you think that we are here? I hear 17th here. Well, I, the 18th is the, is the right answer, but I, I think that the real answer is it could have been written in any age. Why? Does this kind of language keep popping up? Well, I think that, that uh, letters and, and, and books are an important medium for moralizing. And I think that um, we use literature often in a very predatory way, yeah. where we basically uh, 
make distinctions between people. And one of the things I really hate about uh, English left-wing people uh, is that they criticize people who read tabloids. We call them tabloid readers. Yeah, and essentially what they talk about the working class, basically. You know, they read the Daily Mail, they read the Sun and whatever. And instead of saying, well, is, can we give them a, something more intellectually stimulating? Can we, you know, kind of stretch them a bit? They like kind of put down element. You know, oh, they, they, they just read the sun. Mm -hmm. And I was in Hungary recently, in Budapest, and I heard exactly the same thing. These people read this newspaper. <laughs> that's the end of the story there. And what they really are saying is that they are a different species, they're a different race than we are. And it becomes a very self-flattering way. We're not like them. In fact, I, w I went to dinner uh, with a member of my family. I was, you know, I hope this is not recorded. <laughs> and, uh, let's, let's just say it isn't. <laughs> and, you know, you know they're, they're very sweet people, very nice people. And so, uh, so they, she, she's talking about one of her colleagues. And she says, so I said, well, what's she like? And she says, uh, no, she's a really nice person. She reads the Nape Sabachag, which, I don't know, in, in, in Belgium would be like their standard or something like that, you know, sort of a better newspaper and everything else. And that was the end of the story. Because she reads that newspaper, <laughs> you know, she's like us, not like them, you know. So, and I think that's, that kind of uh, categorization, moral categorization, is implicated in real world time. <laughs> So in recent um, months, uh, you've been quite vocal about the fact that you've voted for Brexit. Um, how do you um, how do you look at the way in which we divide people up between good readers and bad readers, and between people who read the right stuff and people who write the wrong stuff? How does that um, compare to the whole process that has led to Brexit and especially to the way in which um, people have been talking about the people who voted for Brexit, because <coughs> most of the time this was considered, these people were considered to be those bad readers, those other people. But they include you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, the morning after Brexit, I go into my butcher's. My wife said, get some nice meat for us. I go into the butcher's, and, my, and the butcher is in a small town. And they're all smiling, and they're all laughing. And I said, you know, why are you, why are you smiling? What's, what's so good? Said, well, we voted for Brexit, and we won. And then the woman behind the counter says to me, how did you vote? So I said, I voted for Brexit as well. And they all start laughing. They don't stop, they just laugh. And I said, why are you laughing? I said, we don't expect someone like you <laughs> to vote for Brexit. You're a professor, you know, how, did, you know, how come you voted for it? And, the, and it was very interesting, because in their eyes, that was them. And there were people like me. And, when, and then in the afternoon, I went to the university. And you know, <laughs> when, I, when I told my colleagues that I worked for Brexit, it was like, it was like being a Jewish person in, 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 in kind of Berlin, 1943. You know, so, so that's what it felt like. Everybody looked at you like, this is like you know, horrible enemy. And, and it seems to me that uh, I voted for Brexit for the same reason I wrote the book. Because uh, it goes back to Socrates. You know, what Socrates says, and I tell this to my students all the time, what he, told, what, what he said was, how come that we let ordinary people, the demos, have an equal say you know, when we're in the Agora? How can we let them do that? Because you know, when it comes to building a ship, we rely on an expert craftsman. You know, when it comes to uh, navigating a ship, we have an expert captain. You know, when we build a house, we don't let anybody build a house. We get an expert architect. But when it comes to politics, everybody's an expert. How could that be? And essentially what he's saying is that decisions about the future of Athens should be decided by people like him, you know, the moral experts, not by ordinary people. And I think you had a very similar debate in, uh, in Brexit, where you had a sense of, if you believe in popular sovereignty, if you believe in democracy, then I think accountability for politicians is really quite important. And a lot of people felt, myself included, that we had a situation where a politician would say in England, oh, oh, you know, Frank, I agree with you, but we have no choice because this is what Europe says. You know, and that was the excuse. Even when they, didn't, even when they were lying, they would, say, they would still say, this is what Europe says, EU says. So I think that uh, if you believe in po popular sovereignty, which I do, 
um, which by the way was the position of the old left. In the 1970s, the left in, in, in uh, England was against the EU for that reason. And I think it's important to realize that the EU is not the same as Europe. Right? I think I'm 150% pro-European. I would love to see Europe being closer, uh, but that's not the same thing as the EU. And people in Belgium think that everybody that votes for Brexit is against immigrants or wants to control, but that's not true either. You know, uh, uh, it's simply about who is co you know, controlling your own political destiny. And I think one can have a very generous policy to immigrants, you can have free movement, I believe in free movement to people, but that's a different issue altogether than the democratic deficit kind of question. But at the same time, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, um, isn't it kind of a problem that in a way you have to um, put up with UKIP? <laughs> if you vote for Brexit, or do you have a way around that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, UKIP is not going to be around for very much longer. You know, it, it's not exactly a, uh, uh, the movement of the future. Uh, and I think that you know, sometimes what you have is, is uh, a situation where people appear to be arguing for something similar, uh, but for very different reasons. So I know people who voted for Brexit, Brexit because they're anti-immigrant. Mm -hmm. I know people that voted for Brexit because they're very nationalistic. Mm -hmm. I know people, so there's very, very many motives why, why people did that. But just because, you know, they're idiots, <laughs> doesn't mean to say that you've got to not stand up your own principles. At the end sure. of the day, yeah. I think democracy is too important yeah. to be uh, pragmatic about. Could you have seen yourself voting differently if the democratic process would have been more transparent? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, two things. I, if the EU was really about uh, freedom of movement, freedom of economics, I would have no problems with that. But none of the political, cultural intervention. Or alternatively, if we have a diversity of, of uh, a genuine diversity of, of, of nations, which you don't have at the moment, um, where rulemaking was much more limited and parliaments had more, you know, sort of uh, say, then I would. I would have no problem with a, a, a unified Europe. Yeah. I could even go for a federalist Europe, you know, if it was democratic. So I've got no problems with that because I don't feel particularly English. You know, I, I probably feel more comfortable in France than I do in England in many ways. I live half my life in Italy because I love Italy. Mm. It's not like, you know, sort of I fly the flag, but I think democracy is really important. And I think we have to remember that for most people in, in, in humanity, meaning and political clarity is gained, not in the abstract, but in the context of their community. And that, and that community, whether we like it or not, is a national community. And we have to make that much more enlightened, rather than to pretend that that doesn't really exist. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to make the community more enlightened? Well, I think uh, one thing is to do more of what we're doing here. But I think it's very important. I, I, I'm a, I think, for me, the most important challenge in the next decade is to educate young people in a way we're not doing at the moment. I think that uh, particularly young people between the age of 16 and 21 are still very idealistic. They still believe in something. You know, this is before they become very cynical and opportunistic and think about career. But at the moment, we're not really giving them, you know, the best of humanity. I mean, the school systems are you know, training them for the workplace. They're very narrow in, in their kind of conceptualization. And we need to somehow think how we can use these our educational resources in a way that is slightly more radical than is the case at the moment. Because, and also very importantly, maybe it's different in Belgium, but certainly in England and in many other places, we have to raise their expectations. You know, that this, that when you're 16, the world can be yours. You know, it's, it's that sense of control. You know, that kind of, you know, take matters into your own hands. We have to create a culture that makes them feel more brave and more able to stand on their two feet rather than the way we're infantilizing them at the moment. Yeah, what's well, the same thing here as it is, I guess, everywhere. Um, talking about stupid people, Donald Trump. <laughs> How are we going to, uh, to survive that? No, let, 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 me, let me ask you a, a better question. Um, um, how do you see his Twitter presidency in the light of, of your book, uh, Power of Reading? Well, I think, I think he, he realizes that's probably the only thing that he's smart about. 
<laughs> he realizes that there's no way he's going to get a good press in the media. There's no way that, you know, even, even the right wing press doesn't like him. So he's not, not going to get a, a good press. And he basically wants to almost develop a direct strategy. He doesn't realize that Twitter <coughs> is actually not as popular as he thinks it is. It's not like, you know, people in the factories are looking at their Twitter. Or, you know, when you go to a bakery, they're all looking at their Twitter. That, that's, people who look at Twitter are people like you and me and, you know, sort of. But nevertheless, he, he does that. He throws those things out. And, uh, and I think that that's a very interesting development. I think that shows us the way in which uh, our, the, the media now works. And I think what it reflects is that there is now a struggle for cultural authority, regardless of Trump. Yeah. And Trump is just in, you know, making use of that uh, for it, you know, in his own way. Would it make a difference if we try to reinstate a sort of narrative for the love of reading? Well, I think it would. I, 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 I was very disappointed by the American election campaign. I, I thought the uh, Clinton campaign was one of the worst. Yeah that I've seen, I, and I was very horrified when, I don't know if it, it was translated into French or Flemish, when, when she talked about all those horrible deplorables, mm -hmm. you know, talking about people like that, you know, imagine if you were, if you use a similar expression towards black people or someone, it would have been seen as, as demeaning and, and, but I thought it was interesting with the casual way that she said it. And what I also, also, also thought was really horrible was that next day in the Washington Post, there was a headline by an opinion writer who said, you know, sort of, you know, we mustn't simply defeat Trump. We have to destroy him and his supporters. Mm. No, we have to destroy and humiliate him and his supporters. So in their eyes, the, the people that would vote for him, you know, they were, didn't seem as being misguided. You know, that's what they really were. I mean, they, you know, they weren't like, you know, Nazi, SS members, they were just misguided people. Mm -hmm. But the way they were talked about was like, you know, they are the physical enemy. And I think if you have that kind of attitude, <coughs> deplorables and everything else, you, you, you do create a condition where instead of educating people, challenging them, arguing with them, but that's not an argument when you call them deplorables, mm -hmm. uh, you give up on them. And I don't, I don't think that we can ever allow progressive people or people who have relatively radical humanistic ideas must never allow themselves, even in the worst moment, to give up on people. Mm -hmm. That's the easy way out, and that's, that's something that we have to avoid in all circumstances. Doesn't it work the other way around as well? Because you might say that Hillary Clinton made a mistake uh, by calling those people, or, or gathering those people in her basket of deplorables, but it doesn't really match up with all the things that Trump said about all kinds of other strata in society. I, I wasn't drawing an equivalence between Trump and Clinton. Yeah. No, I wasn't saying that Trump is my hero or anything like that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I expected so much. I, I think the guy is a complete schmuck, you know, sort yeah. of, and, and a very, you know. Uh, I, guess, I guess my question is if we, we are going to try to raise the expectations of the young people, um, how are we going to um, make sure that uh, the other side is going to do the same thing? Well, well, the other side might not do the same thing. And I have to go on the assumption that they wouldn't do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it's not an argument against us, not us yeah. you know, occupying the low moral ground. Yeah. We have to occupy the moral high ground. It's a bit like, I, I always think of this story where in, in Nazi Germany, you know, in the beginning, before Hitler came to power, uh, they, they were kind of using all this anti-Jewish stuff, you know, sort of here and there. And the Cape Cape Day, the Communist Party reacted to it. They, were, they became very defensive by not letting Jewish speakers speak to workers because they, they, they felt that that would be a problem, which was the worst thing you could do because I think precisely at that moment, you had to get the moral high ground and instead of being defensive about it, you had to go on defense. Similarly against Trump, <coughs> instead of adopting that thing, you have to show that there's a different way of doing things. And that's, that's what distinguishes us from each other. We've been talking for almost an hour now, so I'm going to look into the room to see if there are one or two questions maybe from the audience. And there's one over there. Just being on the last point you mentioned, in my understanding, the emotional part of people where you, you can play on them with fear or on the lower moral side. And 
go and reach them on higher. Uh, but the danger from populism, in my view, is that it's easier maybe to reach people from the fear side rather than to uh, ride them on the upper hills and to try to, to guide them. So how, how can you... So, so maybe the question is, how, how can we frighten people into reading? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but, but three years ago, I was in Rotterdam, and I was doing a debate, and this young woman, and I basically was arguing for free speech for everybody. I'm a free speech absolutist. And this young woman puts up her hand, and she says, well, how can we have free speech when Bill you know, sort of goes on television, and he's so good at speaking, you know, sort of, that he will convince the people that he's right. And I said, well, the problem then is not that Wilder is so good at speaking, the problem is that you are so bad <laughs> at convincing, you know, because you, you, you know, and this is the problem, you know, I hear many left-wing people saying, oh, they're using fear and everything else. What they're really saying is that some of these people speak the language of everyday life. It's not just fear. They can, like, like, in, like we have Farage in England. You know, he doesn't just talk about fear. He speaks like, you know, like somebody in the pub. You can speak like that. When you hear Jeremy Corbyn, he sounds like a, an old-fashioned priest, you know, sort of. You know, he, he, he doesn't capture the, the mood of the people. And I think, you know, I would call myself a, a left-wing or a liberal or a radical populist in, a, in, in, the old, in the proper sense of the word. That's what populism was. It was really standing up for the people and, and, and improving their thing. We have to go out on the streets and we have to not to just talk you know, to people like ourselves. You know, after Brexit, a lot of people at my university came up to me, you know, Frank, I don't understand what happened. All the time before Brexit, I, I never talked to a single person who said they were for Brexit. And, and what they were saying was that they only talked to people like themselves. Right? And I think that's often the problem that we don't, you know, in France, for example, I don't understand. If you take Pas de Calais, region where the Front National is doing so well, mm -hmm. I mean, that used to be the red belt in the old days, you know. <laughs> I mean, why, why did that happen? And of course, the reason why partial whites happened is because the old left there has just lost the capacity to communicate with people there. So it's not, not just fear, I think it's the other side that is as much to blame as anything else. Quick, no, I'm afraid that we're out of time. Um, Frank, uh, thank you very much for this conversation. I hope that everyone in this room especially the people who haven't read this book yet are going to read it and tell uh, their, uh, the publishers in their language to publish this in their language. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a lot of fun today.